Dad, thank you for tossing ball in the backyard. Thank you for the fishing trips to the lake, staying up late when mom wasn't home, and for spending time playing action figures and video games. Thank you for teaching me how to take out the trash, mow the lawn, and how to speak with respect towards other people. From the late nights at work, the blistered hands, dirty work boots, and time spent fixing and refixing things around the house, thank you for showing me responsibility and what it means to help provide and take care of others. Thank you for showing me how to become a man who seeks after God, who takes care of his loved ones, works hard, and knows when it's time to have fun. For all the dads out there, biological, foster, mentors, stepdads, granddads, and those men who have stepped in when needed, thank you for being you. Happy Father's Day. All right, well, welcome to Florence Baptist Church. I'm Travis, glad that you're with us today. Happy Father's Day. But there's also another very important day, and that is it's Juneteenth, which is a new national holiday for us. And it's a really uh, an important day, so I just want to uh, say a couple of statements about that. If you're unfamiliar or haven't done any uh, uh, study of what it's about, back in 1863, January 1st, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed all slaves in the United States. There were roughly three million at that point in our country, but not. Uh, but the news hadn't really reached everyone. It took a little while. And so sure enough, on this particular day in 1865, some two plus years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, some Union soldiers showed up in Galveston, Texas to let the last slaves in America know they had been freed. Now here's the cool part about that. Upon hearing about their freedom, the very first thing they did was pray. And I love that. They prayed, they ate, they danced, and they sang together. And I love everything about that. And as Christians, we can fully get behind that because we believe that all people should be free, not just physically, but we also believe because the power of Christ, everyone should be free spiritually. And you can if you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. So it is happy Juneteenth as a nation and also happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room. We're in a series called Finding Joy and we're walking through the book of Philippians. So let's just start by reading Philippians uh, chapter four, verse one where Paul says, So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And what we're going to find today in this passage uh, of the letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in the city of Philippi is he really gives uh, some, some very helpful, really, commands that the Lord gives uh, on how we can have joy, really, every day of our lives. Now, I, I don't know about you, but when I hear, oh, you can have joy every day of our lives, it feels like something from home. Hallmark, but I'm telling you, it is true from a Christian biblical perspective, you can experience joy in your life every single day. And the very first thing that Paul gives to us is to stand firm. Now, that's some military language. I love reading Paul. If you're a man, I think you'll enjoy reading Paul. He's all about sports and all about the military. And this is some military language he uses here because the idea is a soldier staying faithfully at his post no matter what happens around him. And my mind immediately goes to Buckingham Palace. Now look at this picture here. This picture is from 1957. These guards, this, these are the royal guards and they're standing in a position called eyes forward. And in eyes forward, it means you don't move no matter what's happening. And this poor guy on the end is passing out from heat exhaustion. And notice the guy next to him. He's like trying to cling for his hand. And the guy next to him, he's not moved an inch. Actually, he'd have been in trouble if he did. But they have medical people always around. So you don't move. The medical people could attend to him. But I'm told eyes forward. I'm not budging. And I think the Apostle Paul, when he's writing Stand Firm, is kind of in a similar position where he's saying the enemy's going to attack, but you you can't, you can't move off the course of what God has for you. You need to stand firm in the faith. The orders, the orders are clear for us as soldiers in the army of God. You need to stand firm. But then my mind goes another direction from Buckingham Palace all the way to Tom Petty. And I can't help but think of the Tom Petty song that said, I won't back down. You know, come on, guys. You're leaving me stranded, right? You can stand me up at the gate of hell, but I... Well, back down. Yeah, see, I knew you were out there, right? No, I won't back down. See, and I'm telling you right now, you're going to be singing that all day long. And if you haven't, if you're a dad and you haven't 
let your kids listen to that song, you're not a good dad, all right? They, you, need to, you need to let them hear that song. It's good classic music right there. No. I think when Paul says stand firm here, I think really he has in mind a real healthy perspective of Satan's attempts, knowing that Satan wants to thwart you and I off God's game plan for our lives. He wants to discourage us and kind of throw us off course, and he knows that we would be tempted to leave our post when the bullets of temptation go whizzing past our head, he knows that we will tempt to be tempted to give up or to run or to hide, and so he repeats it. Actually, all throughout Paul's letters, he says it about 16 times, stand firm, stay, stay strong in the faith, pursue the Lord, run hard after him. Are you familiar with this term, stay in the traces? You ever heard that? It's actually a phrase that comes out of the colonial period of America, and it has to do with wagon wheels, horse and, and buggy kind of era, that where the, war, the, the wagon wheels would kind of work in the same patterns over and over again, it would create little ruts in the road from the wheels, and they're called traces. Now, when I lived in Nashville, there is a beautiful national parkway called Natchez Trace. It is stunning. It runs all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, all the way to Natchez, Mississippi, on the banks of the Mississippi River, and it is stunning. It is, it is beautiful. Anyone who wanted to go to Texas from this part of the country would go to the Natchez Trace in Nashville and work their way down to Mississippi and on into Texas. Actually, prior to 1742, it was only a footpath, which I can't imagine making that journey hundreds of miles, uh, you know, through the mountains and valleys trying to get all the way down to Mississippi. But then, moving forward with the inventions of the, the, the wagon and horse and buggy, people would ride their wagons down, and people knew if you wanted to get to Natchez, Mississippi, you just had to get the wagon wheels in the traces. Look at this picture here. It's, it's beautiful. I don't know. Did y'all get to see it? Oh, y'all saw it. All right, man, the AV team, they're, man, they're on it, right? This is a beautiful picture. It's stunning. But that is just a, 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 mere, a mere clip. There's actually places of Natchez Trace. You can still go today, and you can see the traces from the wagon wheels some 200 years later. It, it, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible to think about. I think the same is true when it comes to our spiritual life. Most days in our journey, there's nothing overly exciting. It's kind of like asking your, your kids how the school day went. How was it? Fine. Which meant they went to school, saw their teachers, saw their classmates, went to the next class, next class, did their homework, all that good stuff, and it was fine. And that's true. That's actually the majority of life, I think. Uh, the overwhelming majority of our lives will be lived in what we call the routine or in the ordinary, and that's okay. It means we get up each day and we do what God has for us to do. As a Christian, we should be asking ourselves, what is God's will for our lives? And, and, and from the scriptures, God's will for our lives is that we would live according to what God has for us to do, which means in the days of the ordinary, what do we do? We get up and we put forth effort to do what God has for us to do. And that means sometimes... As we're going through the traces of life, particularly on our spiritual journeys, we all will be tempted to jump the traces. You get bored, you think there's something greener on the other side of the fence, and Satan comes along to try to tempt you. You've been in a really good rut for a really long time, and he goes, these ruts over here are better. Now, I can just say, after 23 years in ministry, I have yet to meet a person who had good, positive things, and they prospered on the other side of jumping the traces. What you do in that moment is you trade good ruts, and that's okay, rut in our world has a negative connotation, but there actually are some good ruts you can get into. Uh, you think of the long haul over, over your marriage, uh, that's a good rut to be in. You think of a long friendship that goes back to your childhood, that's a good rut to be in. You think of being with a company and being promoted uh, through the ranks because of your tenure, that's a good rut to be in. So there are good ruts in life, but when we're talking about our spiritual lives, there are some other ruts in life that take us off the course that God has for us, and it is tempting to go there sometimes, but I'm just telling you, you might find some boredom in the traces you've been in for a long time, but they're still good ruts, and positive things come out of them, but I'm telling you, if you trade those traces for the other traces, what you find in those traces are a lot of guilt, and a lot of shame, and a lot of embarrassment, and a lot of, of horrible, broken hearts in the process, and those are bad traces to get in, and so he says, stand firm in the faith. We get to verse two, he says this, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. The second piece that, that Paul gives us on how we can experience joy every day is he says, settle your differences. 
And there's these two women here that couldn't get along with each other. One was named Euodia. Now, believe that, you know, this is crazy. Her name means sweet smell. And Syntyche, her name means friendly. Well, somehow, old sweet smell and old friendly couldn't get along. I don't even know how that happens, how they get those names. But they, always had, they, they hadn't always been fighting. Because Paul says, we contended together for the gospel, which means that at, at at some point earlier, they were getting along just fine. If you were with us at the beginning of this series, you'll remember that the, the church in Philippi started because of a women's prayer group. And there were a bunch of ladies there. There are a lot of scholars that believe these two ladies were probably a part of that original prayer group that then launched into the church at Philippi. And they now have come to an impasse. They're kind of in conflict. And he says, can you settle your differences can you figure out how to make it work? Can you be unified again for the sake of the gospel? Now, when he says that, that doesn't mean they need to see eye to eye on every detail. And that's true for us today. I mean, God on purpose made us vastly unique and different. Different proclivities and oddities and weird. You know, I've said this before. I think everybody's a little weird, including me, right? You know, we're all just a little weird. And he made us different on purpose. There's great variety, which just shows how amazing and creative of a God he is. But still, we can be unified in the things that matter, particularly the gospel. And these women were. And so even though they weren't going to see eye to eye on every detail, he's saying you need to make the personal choice to focus on the things that really unite you guys, namely Jesus Christ. Now, if um, I believe Christians should be the best at conflict. We really should be the experts in it because we've been given God's truth and in God's truth, according to his design, that he is Lord over all, he's given us a game plan for how to handle conflict. And I don't have enough time to go into it today, but if that interests you, we did a series where we spent uh, several weeks on it uh, back in the er early spring called Let's Fight. And I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about how to do conflict from a biblical perspective. But here's what he's saying. We need to think hard about our relationships. Matter of fact, I'd encourage you right now, do an inventory of your relationships. How's your relationship with your dad? I know for a lot of people, that can be a point of contention. If you're a dad, how's your relationship with your kids? How's the relationship with your wife, your coworkers, your friends? Was there a relationship that you had from childhood that's been broken off because of something happened? I would say Paul here is encouraging us, we need to settle our disagreements. And if you can't settle your disagreements completely, you should at least make a sincere effort to make as much amends as you possibly can and make steps in that direction. So he says, settle your differences. Thirdly, we get to verse four. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. This is the only one that's repeated, by the way. He says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. At this point, uh, Paul tells us we need to ask God to help us live graciously. Now, Greek scholars tell us that word is really hard to interpret. Now, I've tried to fill around with it. It is. It's unique. That's why you find a lot of different words used for it. Uh, some interpreters use moderation. Some use forbearance. Some use gentleness. Uh, one commentator actually called it inner calmness, which I, I kind of like that one. But I also think this is the most difficult one to do, and I think that's why Paul repeated it. Uh, that we would actually uh, live graciously with people. He says, rejoice and be gracious. Now, he says, because the Lord is near. Now, my mind goes to grandpa visiting, right? Uh, uh, my kids uh, had both of their grandfathers and grandmothers up yesterday, and it, it's fun, right, when you get to tell your kids, like, oh, grandpa's coming. And my kids are like, oh, pops is coming. Now, like, we have pops and pop in our family, which can kind of be confusing when, you know, you're little and growing up, but it becomes more clear with age, right? There's pops and pop. And you just tell your kids, hey, pop's coming. And they're like, yeah, woo, pop's is coming. It's awesome. Pop is going to be here soon. It's going to be great. And then after the rejoicing part, there's another part that comes along. And that other part that comes along is, and so by the way, daggum, you better be on your best behavior. Right? We're sharing today. I don't care what it takes. We're all sharing everything, right? There's no arguing. Put your devices down. We're not going to be hung up on your phones. When your grandpa's made the way to get all the way up here to see you, they love you. You know, they got cool stories to tell you. You know, you, you just go down the list, right, on all that stuff. And, and so the, there's this piece that's woven up here where, where Paul's telling us we need to rejoice. Now, there's, I don't know about you, that kind of lands with me where why do I feel like Paul's telling me how I'm supposed to feel? I don't really like when people do that. It's kind of it's like, why are you telling me how to feel right now? But he's saying rejoice. And, and rejoice is, is, is different than, than joy because you're like, how do I turn on the joy, right? Joy is a noun, but rejoice is a verb. We don't get to pick the noun. We don't get to pick the emotion. 
we do get to pick our actions. And he's saying here, you get to choose. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You can choose to rejoice regardless of how you feel. And the fact that the Lord is coming near gives us reason to rejoice. It's like grandpa coming. He is on the way. He's gonna be here soon and you should rejoice. But then he says gracious. How can we, how can we be gracious in the way in which we live? And again, it's built upon the fact that the Lord is near. It meant that the Lord is on his way. Now, I wanna define for us what graciousness is, how it works for us. It's when we begin to believe and trust that we're not the Lord. We can be gracious with people when we realize I'm not the one that has to be in control of everything because that's a lot of weight to carry, right? It, if the way the world functions and the way that people interact and the way that all things are supposed to work is based upon your responsibility, we're in trouble. No one can carry that. No one can handle that except the Lord alone. But we like to move into that space uh, because we like control sometimes, but we need to be reminded here. And Paul does says, no, you are not in control. And since you're not in control, you don't have to carry the weight that you can't carry. And therefore it frees you up to be gracious towards other people, to be loving towards other people, that you can be peaceful and kind and full of joy and caring and compassionate and truthful. As a matter of fact, in the Christian world, we would say these are the fruits of God's spirit living within us and we're freed up for those fruits to come out of our lives when we realize he's the Lord and we're not the Lord we don't have to fix everything we don't have to be in control of everything because he is and Jesus is on the way now here's a simple question for us it's simple to ask it's really hard would the people that are in your circle would they say you are a gracious person let's make it a little harder would the person or people you like the least say that you're a gracious person? Because we all know around nice people, it's easy to be kind and gracious and considerate, passionate, caring, loving. But when it comes to those people that we like the least or likes us the least, if they're convinced that we're gracious, that can only happen through the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. Paul says we need to ask God to help us live graciously. Verse six, he says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. He says the next piece to finding joy on a regular is find peace in prayer. He says, don't worry about anything. Now, I don't know, when you read that, I'm kind of like, come on, man. Don't worry about anything? I don't even know if I can do that. Now, here's the thing about worry. Worry is like looking at God and going, God, I don't really trust that you're gonna care for me, so I'll just take matters into my own hands. And then we begin to worry. Worry is actually assuming responsibility that God never intended for us to have. And again, I don't know about you, but reading it this way, it feels like God's kind of telling me how to feel again. He's going, hey, don't worry about anything. Don't have that emotion. Now, I'm trying to compare that to other commands God gave, like, hey, don't murder. And I'm like, hey, I got that one, okay? I did a pretty good job yesterday. I think I nailed it, right? I didn't murder anybody. Got it, right? No problem. But this one here is, it feels like he's saying, don't get sick. Don't be anxious. And it's like, well, sometimes I don't get sick. Sometimes the illness gets me. You know, it's like saying, don't catch a cold, but you're like, the cold caught me. I, I can't, what do you want me to do, Lord? I feel like I've, I've like violated your commands because I didn't do, but I don't know what else to do. Well, here's the truth. I, I think what Paul's getting at here, and he, it, we're gonna marry some things together because we typically make this thing stand alone, but, but Paul wrote these things together on purpose, is that we need to take responsibility where we can. Because when it comes to being sick, there are some things we can do, right? Like if you talk to your family doctor, they're gonna say like, yeah, it's probably a good idea to wash your hands on a regular basis, right? It's a good idea. It's a good strategy, and that is true. You know, if you stay away from sick people, probably a good strategy to keep you healthier longer. If you tell me you have Ebola, I'm not coming to your house. Why? I don't want it. And therefore, I've got a pretty good percentage chance that I'm not gonna get what you've got because I'm not coming around you and I'm not coming near you, right? Now, it doesn't definitely mean we're never getting sick, but even if I do, there are some things I can proactively do to pursue wellness. But here's the thing. He's not saying just don't be anxious. If we continue on in the thought, it's don't be anxious, but in everything through prayer. And those ideas get linked together. He's saying don't be anxious without prayer. Don't be anxious without prayer. 
So even the next time you have these anxious feelings stirring up inside of you, you haven't violated the Lord's command, but he's saying, don't stay in that state long without getting towards some prayer. Like, if you're really pursuing me in in our relationship, I need you tapping in. That's what I'm asking you to do is like, I'm here for you and I'm available to you, but you gotta take your anxiousness and it needs to be moving you towards prayer. He's saying there is something you can actually do to fight against the anxiousness that you experience in this world. There's actually something you can do to fight back on the burdens of this life. So don't be anxious without prayer. It actually promises here, he's like, when you take your burdens to me or you bring them to me, there's an exchange that goes on. You bring your worries to me and what I give back to you is peace. He actually says the peace that will guard your heart. That idea again, Paul's writing in military language. It's the idea that a soldier would be guarding the city gate from the inside and he's saying, when you come to me with your anxious thoughts and your worry, all of a sudden I am present in your life in a unique way like soldiers guarding the city gate. I'm now guarding your heart, protecting you from the cares of the world that will consume you. It's too much for you. You can't handle it and therefore I'm readily available to help you. So here's what that means for Christians. It means that we must must allow anxiety to become a cue for us in prayer. I kind of think of it as like the backup camera on a car. You know, there's green, yellow, red, and you back up and it starts to beep. You know, it's like beep, beep. The closer you get, beep, 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 beep. And he's saying, let that go off. When you start feeling anxious in life, it needs to be like the backup camera. It should be beeping loud and it should be beeping fast. And that needs to be a trigger for you in your spiritual journey that you should be moving into pro- towards prayer, that you should be actually communicating and connecting with God. Then he moves into this next session. This next session, Paul's gonna talk about our minds. And our minds are kind of like television screens. They're like big television screens. And the kicker is we can never turn them off, but we can always change the channel. Look at verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And this is where Paul says, this final piece here, that you can find peace in right thinking and right action. Now, I want to be clear here. What he says is not an if-then statement. If you think about these things, God gives you peace. This is not that kind of if-then kind of thing. He's saying more of like, these are just true for you. You think about these things, and guess what? Don't you dare forget that the God of peace is with you. He already made the promise to never leave you or forsake you, and you need to live in that truth. You need to be able to take your anxious thoughts and wrap them in the truth of God. Now, he he kind of takes our mind, and, and I think of it as like a storage container. And he's saying there's things that we put in it all the time. There's our thoughts, there's memories, there's ideas we have, there's, there's knowledge, stuff we learn, and all that goes into our storage container. And during the day, as we're living our lives, we need to be careful what we put in the storage container. Because when you wake up in the middle of the night, you ever wake up in the middle of the night? Yeah, me too. Happened this week. You wake up in the middle of the night, and then you make a big mistake like I do and I pick my phone up and check the time and I thought it was 6 o'clock but it's only 2.30 and now that I've looked at my phone and that blue light's hit my eyes I'm a little bit awake and then my mind starts going because you can't shut your mind off and it starts reeling and the things that you go to are from the thoughts that you've put in your storage container throughout the day and sometimes it's kids. And you start thinking and worrying about your kids and your kids are there and you just think, oh my kids and we've got this struggle going on and we've got to take care of this and I can't believe, man, they got a little broken heart and I'm gonna to have to help them. Sometimes it's finances and you just start thinking about the financial pressures of living and you're thinking inflation and gas prices and food prices and I gotta work and sometimes it's, it's work and so you just, you know, you pick your phone up and you start getting to work and you think of the email stacking and all of that that you gotta respond to. It's sometimes politics, right? And sometimes it's, I can't believe they did this. We just need to get this passed. That law, we've gotta figure this out. And, it's, and there's like thousands of other things, right? And what Paul's saying here is you gotta be careful what you put in your storage box because when you wake up in the middle of the night and your brain doesn't shut off and it starts to roll again, you're only going back to anxious things. 
And if the anxious thoughts are what you put in during the day, the anxious thoughts are the only thing you have to go back to when you wake up in the middle of the night, and it becomes this vicious cycle, and there's no way out. And therefore, Paul creates a game changer here because he says, no, what I want you to think about in that moment is what is true. You need to think about what's true. Now, what's true? God's word is true. That's why the Bible says, your word that I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Or read Psalm 1 where it talks about the man whose life flourishes because he's like a tree planted by streams of water who, who meditates on God's law day and night. He flourishes. God's true. It's true that he's a mighty fortress. It's true that he's our good shepherd. It's true that he is a good, good father and he is our shelter. That's true. And if you didn't put that in your storage container earlier today, it's gonna to be really hard to pull that out at 2.30 in the morning. He's saying you need to think about what is honorable. And honorable for us just means how will we do the right thing? I'll tell you about what's honorable. The marriage covenant is honorable. That you can think about, man, my marriage, how do I make my marriage better? And how do I love my spouse better? Being a good parent is honorable. You can think about how do I honor the Lord in the way of which I parent my kids he says, you gotta think about what's right and what's pure and what's lovely. What's lovely? I'll tell you, Jesus is lovely. Now, I know it's not necessarily the manliest language to talk about what's lovely. I'll just say, a few songs ago, we were singing Roar, right? So, I, you know, I feel like it's a fair trade-off, right? But what's lovely? Jesus is lovely. The fact that Jesus would be the savior of the world and die on the cross for my sins and for your sins, and three days later, he raised from the dead, proving he's God, that is a lovely thought. And it's a good thought that when you're feeling anxious in life, it's a very good thought for you to rest your heart and your soul and your mind upon. He says, you dwell on these things that are commendable and excellent and praiseworthy. See, what happens is when I can't sleep and I wake up in the middle of the night with anxiousness, I'm telling you, we need to view that as a cue. You and I need to view that as a prompt from the Lord. And he's going, hey, I want to spend some time with you. We really need to start taking that as a cue going, all right, God, let's hang. Let's spend a little bit of time together. All right, God, I need your help on this because right now I'm thinking about my kids and I just don't feel like I'm living up to it as a dad. God, I need your help. Think about what's praiseworthy. What is praiseworthy? God is. God, you are so powerful. I'm just a blip on the God, you are in control of everything. My problems are like nothing to you. God, you're the one that's mighty above all things. God, you are the sovereign God of the universe. These thoughts that then go, how does a God like that love me? And it takes you to, God, you've chosen me. God, you love me. You protect me. You guide me. You lead me. You see me. You know me. And I'm just saying, that is a much better way to spend your time. It is a much better way for me to spend my time we need to be careful what we're storing away in the storage containers of our mind because that is what is available to us in the moment of our anxious thoughts. And so Paul says to us, we can find peace in right thinking. But then in verse nine, he starts that verse with the word do. And then he's talking about right action, that we actually need to put our faith into work. Now here's the best news. The best news is you have the power to do it. All the commands listed here, if you're a Christ follower, you have the power of God in your life, and guess what? You can do all these things. You can literally change your mind by focusing on what is true and right and honorable and on and on as the list goes. You can do that with the power of God in your life. You can change your life by the power of God working in your life. Say, so how does that work? It's by remembering that everything that is best is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we worship him. Everything that is of all virtue, all beauty, all holiness, all truth, everything that is good and right is found in him. And as I say that, I'm not talking about some weird abstract philosophy. I'm actually talking about a personal relationship with a holy God who changes everything. And you can, with the help of Jesus, have a changed life. I don't know about you, but in moments like this, I feel like, man, I need to do something. And maybe God's leading you to do something with your faith today that you would put your faith into practice that maybe you're here and you're like, I do need to stand firm in the faith. I need to develop some convictions. I hope you do. I hope you'd make a commitment to that. Matter of fact, I would even say this. Dads, you want your kids to have a robust faith? You better live one in front of them. 
You, you want to see your kids love the Lord? I'm telling you, they're watching you. Their eyes are set on you. You need to settle your differences. And if you want your kids to be able to settle the differences that they have with people in their life, they need to watch you as a model talking about it at the dinner table. This is how I settled this with this person. I know I was at odds with them, but this is how we settled it. They need to see it modeled for you. They need to overhear the conversation in the car that you have on the phone driving down the interstate. They need to hear that you are settling your differences. You need to be gracious. You need to really ask the Lord, God, would you help me have a gracious, gentle heart towards other people? One, so that when words fall out of my mouth, they're gracious words and my kids overheard them and it impacted them. The decisions that I'm making to be gracious would hopefully impact my kids because they saw me live it out. That they would, that you would find peace in prayer. Not that you're just praying, which is fine, you know, in the quietness of your room or in the car on the way to work or in the office, that's all great, but your kids need to see it. Your kids need to hear it and they need to hear it from you. They're looking for finding peace and right thinking and right action. Dad, I'm telling you, they are looking at you. Now, this applies to all of us. I, I'm uniquely making it for dads, but it's true for all of us. Matter of fact, if you have any spiritual need, you want to trust in Christ, be baptized, join a small group, find a place to serve, figure out how to be on mission with your life, in, any of those kinds of questions, prayer needs, et cetera, you can go to our Next, step, next Steps uh, area when the service is over. If you're watching online, you can text the word TALK to 77411. But I want to end today a little uniquely. And that is, if you're a dad, I want to ask you and invite you to come, come up and, and stand down here with me. I actually have a gift on the stage here that I want to give to you, but I also want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So if you're a dad, come on, guys. Lead the way, man. Somebody break the mode. There we go. Yeah, give it up for dads. So here's the thing. You can go ahead and grab these. These are called challenge coins. And I don't know if you've ever seen a challenge coin, but the history goes back 100 years to World War I. And what happened is challenge coins would be given out as a way to commemorate and even help people remember that they were a part of a significant moment. Uh, It it spread. There was just a pocket of people that that would have received uh, something like a challenge coin in in World War I. There were actually moments when men were called on the carpet, whether they actually participated in certain uh, battles, they had to present their challenge coin as proof that they they were there and they were a part of it. That's how important these things were. Actually, today in all branches of the military, they continue to give out challenge coins. Now here at Florence Baptist Church, we're on what we believe is God's mission for us as laid out in the book of Acts. And it's no different than really God gave any church. But here, we believe we want everyone to experience Jesus, to grow together. I know that's hard for men. We tend to think we can take the hill by ourselves, but God wired us for relationships, and so we believe we can grow together. And then thirdly, we want to help people make a difference with their lives because we believe that God created you uniquely and me uniquely to fulfill certain tasks that he laid out for us before the foundations of the world. Now here's the thing. This challenge coin I hope serves you well. One, as a reminder to stand firm in the faith. That, that every time you look at this thing or if you put it in your pocket and you feel it kind of, kind of like, you know, hit the corner of a table and it chings or something like that, I hope that you remember we're trying to to live out our faith in a way that would honor the Lord based upon Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, and that we would stand firm. But then also this, I hope it serves as a reminder to you that you're a part of the greatest mission ever, and that's the mission of the Lord Jesus Almighty. That is worthwhile for us to give our lives to. So let me pray over you. God, we are so grateful for these men God, we're grateful that first and foremost, you are a good father. You're actually the perfect father. All of us here, we all fall short, starting with me. And God, I pray that through the power of Jesus Christ, you would overcome and overshadow our deficiencies so that our kids can see Jesus in our lives. And God, as these men are here, I pray that you would help them stand firm in the faith. God, you've said reverence for God gives man a deep strength. And what we need today are men with deep, deep strength. God, would you help us to build a firm foundation on you? God, when everyone else 
in this life is running a race for acquisitions and achievements and accomplishments and appearance and for self. God, would you help us remember what matters most and that is to love, to love you first and foremost. God, to love our spouses if we're married. God, to love our children, to love our friends, in particular to the Christian calling that we would even love our enemies well. God, would you help us remember that you said our care for others is the measure of our greatness. And God, would you help us model what you did for us and that is you gave up your life for us and therefore would you help us give our lives away and help us learn what it means to really live because you said if a man gives up his life, he's truly found it. God, we believe that aside from your word and people, everything else passes away. So God, would you help us do your will until we see you face to face. God, I pray that you would give these men a new sense of courage, courage to stand alone if need be, that they would be a man of honor, that they'd be strong in their faith, and they would do everything through the love of Christ. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, fellas.